So I'd like to begin by acknowledging that I am presented, presenting on the stolen lands of the Wurundjeri and Boon people of the Kulin Nation. And I'd like to pay my respects to its traditional owners and to their elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to extend uh, that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in attendance at GCAP. So sovereignty was never ceded and the violence of colonial structures and policies are ongoing. This always was and always will be Aboriginal land. So, hello. This is my talk on cultivating playful culture, presented by me. So, who am I? Well, first of all, I'm a game designer. But if you want more specifics, my name is Duncan Corrigan. I'm studying a master's in animation games and interactivity at RMIT. I love playful and expressive games. And it is my personal goal to cultivate playful culture through the games that I make and other creative endeavors. And that's sort of what today's talk is about. Uh, here are some games that I've worked on. Uh, they're all pretty small projects uh, that I've mostly made with my friends. Um, I'm also part of a collective in Sydney uh, with my friends uh, George Mack, Kwa uh, Moreno, Jay Stewart, and Kave Tabar. Uh, we're called Serenade, and we do small pop-up uh, video game exhibitions celebrating uh, experimental games in Sydney. Um, our hope is to sort of bring visibility to interesting and heartfelt works uh, to a broader creative community, uh, as well as cultivate a scene of art games um, in Sydney. So these are the questions I'm looking to answer today. Um, what is playful culture? Uh, why is it beneficial? And how can we cultivate it? Here's just like an overview. I want to start by looking at how playfulness is perceived in current culture and why that is. Uh, from here, I want to look at how that affects us and our personal values and how it influences games and gaming culture as well. Then I'll be looking at what it means to be playful and how we inspire playfulness in others and then how we might ultimately achieve that with the games that we make. Lastly, I'll be looking at what a culture that promotes and celebrates playfulness might look like. So, first of all, unplayful culture. Our society values performance, efficiency, and productivity. It celebrates things being done quickly and in the best way possible. Society rewards this kind of work, this kind of hard work. We can see this in things like academic, academic achievements or rewards at work for going above and beyond your duties, uh, which sometimes even means overworking, right? It makes natural sense that in our society, uh, people are rewarded for these kinds of things. Conversely, we rarely celebrate someone for enjoying themselves or taking a break or engaging in the things that they love. Play is discouraged because it's not as performant, it's not efficient or straight to the point, and it doesn't really aim to be any of these things. We might see it as a waste of time because it's silly, it meanders, it's not efficient. Our own leisure or discretionary time can sometimes to begin, begin to feel a bit indulgent or unnecessary, or at the very least, we feel that we should limit it because it's not as productive. So where does this come from? Well, capitalism, basically. The eternal struggle between going on and goofing off. We have a society based around economic growth, so things that make money are perceived as more valuable. And the opposite is true. Things that don't contribute to making money are perceived as less valuable. When we, broadly speaking, determine the value of our time by how it relates to economic growth, uh, we can see how this might discourage play. Uh, we can see that education and jobs are perceived as valuable because they lead to economic growth in quite a direct way whereas engaging with games or art is perceived as less valuable uses of our time. They're not as productive. And uh, people are often 
are also often anxious to engage in things that aren't considered um, serious or meaningful. Uh, people don't want to appear childish or silly um, because these are perceived as undesirable traits. I'd also like to touch on this idea of algorithmic and heuristic work. Um, so algorithmic work is formulaic. It requires attention to detail and the ability to follow orders, staying status quo. Historically speaking, algorithmic work has been in large demand due to the large requirements of laborers in times of industrialization. So our education systems uh, have naturally been designed to prepare us for this kind of work. Uh, playfulness impedes algorithmic work. So it's not a trait that is commonly encouraged or practiced in schools. In fact, it's quite aggressively discouraged. On the other hand, heuristic work requires new thinking, new ideas, uh, creativity and self-direction and motivation. Uh, something playful engagement is excellent at nurturing. And uh, our modern day problems, like, you know, as an example, climate crisis, the climate crisis, should I say, uh, now demand creative thinkers and leaders. So we now need people more equipped for heuristic work. <clears throat> so internalized culture. So this culture becomes internalized and can influence our values. We automatically accept that work is more important than play, that studying is more valuable than goofing off. This can cause conflict within ourselves uh, where we can often feel anxious. For example, we may feel guilty for slacking off at work or not staying back late. Uh, we can feel guilty for taking time to look after ourselves or enjoying ourselves, or at least we limit the time that we do because it's not as important as work. Our own mental health is often overlooked in favor of being more performant, efficient, or productive. Um, this is most obvious in stuff like work culture, overworking or crunch can sometimes be even applauded as a noble thing. And people often feel they need to work harder or longer hours to feel, like, uh, to feel valuable. So how does this internalized culture influence games and consumer culture? Well, there's this idea of uh, progression obsession. Like it's, it's widely expected that games should have some kind of objective or a way to win. Why is that? Well, goals are a non-vague and tangible indicator of progress, uh, which would be a suitable incentive for a culture that values uh, performance and productivity. A challenge that takes practice and effort uh, to overcome feels more valuable and more worthwhile. Uh, if you can't progress, if you can't win, it's a less meaningful activity. It's not performant or productive. Often games feel they are designed as if progressing the player through the game is the most important thing, uh, rather than progress being a natural consequence of playful engagement. Games will often incentivize and reward higher skill play and player dedication with achievement systems and other rewards. These can alter the perceived value of certain interactions as they afford that tangible progress, uh, leaning into our impulse to feel productive. However, this sort of strong arming of players through your game, um, either through like compelling them with extrinsic motivators um, or just you know over tutorialization often gets in the way of players' ability to um, fully engage in a playful manner. So games are also often considered by many as uh, sort of like low class culture as unproductive or childish. Games are not a valuable use of, of time in a society interested in economic growth, I guess broadly speaking. So even within the community of people who play games, um, certain games are seen as lesser, games that are um, meandering or toy-like, uh, that can't be beaten or have no serious tones or um, sort of like mature narrative themes. Um, and I suppose there's a sense that there's this sort of like insecurity generated by this conflict of, of having this hobby uh, that is perceived as a waste of time by general public, by the general public. Uh, and I think over time, uh, gaming culture uh, and the games industry's collective attempt to justify this hobby has led to a bit of, of homogenization, a sort of downward spiral, 
where games try to fall more in line with our culture's values to satisfy these internalized pressures and impulses. Um, this would mainly apply to uh, games in the AAA space, uh, which are looking to uh, appeal to very broad audiences. Um, lastly, we can also see this influence on the perceived value of games, uh, how much people are willing to spend on a game, or specifically how little. Uh, games with large maps that tout hundreds of hours of things to do, that have high fidelity graphics, these are seen as more valuable um, by strict measurement. These things are bigger and have more in them, and thus they represent better value for your dollar. Okay, so this is my definition of playfulness. So being playful is making the most of a situation uh, with volition and autonomy. So it is acting sort of free of any extrinsic motivation. Uh, you are simply driven by the autonomous urge to engage completely and make a moment the best it can be. Finding new ideas and opportunities. Uh, we are born engaging in this way. It's essential to developing critical skills as a newborn. You know, a baby is not motivated by a steady paycheck, yet they take the time to learn to walk and talk. Uh, we can also see younger children tend to be less anxious to play and have unprompted enthusiasm to engage. So if we struggle being playful, it's only because we have been actively discouraged or taught that we shouldn't. So, playfulness. Where we play is not limited to games. Not everyone likes games and that's okay. It's more about finding what inspires you to be playful or what your rituals of play look like. And I wanna acknowledge that there's like many different reasons to play games as, you know, as a way to relax or de-stress and those are valuable too. But volition is an integral part of the definition, of my definition of play because it's about doing what you enjoy these are uh, discretionary activities that you're engaged with because you like them, um, because you want to do them. But you can also find ways to be playful in all aspects of your daily life. You can be playful at work, or you can be playful in a conversation. This might look like um, trying to make the other person laugh, or covering interesting new topics, making a greater effort to empathize, and seek new perspectives. So, what does playful engagement look like? Here are some examples of uh, things that inspire playful engagement. Uh, role play, um, it's not about making the best decision, but trying to empathize with another point of view and make actions based on this new perspective. Uh, it's more expressive and introspective and not driven by a rigid, uh, rigid set of values or goals. Um, improv is great too. It has no strict objective beyond um, creating something entertaining. Uh, it can be a bit directionless um, where the only output is what you put in. Like the only real reason to engage uh, with improv is out of the joy of making the most of a scene. Um, so I've, I think it's extremely playful. It's also extremely scary for people, which I find interesting. Dance as well has no particular agenda and no rules to follow. Um, it's very expressive and you move your body in ways that feel satisfying and fun. Parkour as well is re-examining um, spaces and gaining new perspectives uh, for new opportunities of engagement. And uh, like jumping on shit is just really cool. Um, I do want to clarify that play is not about breaking the rules. Uh, rebellion is in fact just sort of like another form of conformity in the sense that it is based on rules. That is, you do exactly the opposite of what you're told. Uh, where I see playful engagement sitting outside of rules altogether, it may be informed by them, but it is not driven by them. I'm inspired by, oh, my slides did something weird, sorry. Okay, so I'm inspired by the Metagaming Manifesto by Stephanie Bullock and Patrick Lemieux. A lot of their work revolves around the importance of acknowledging the radical plasticity of play uh, to prevent games from falling into inflexible templates, uh, like inflexible capitalistic templates. 
Uh, the forming of these templates can kind of be observed in the mass homogenization of play uh, that's present within AAA space. It's a narrowing of our definition of what it means to play or what play even looks like down to the common verbs of mechanics, so like first person shooters. Uh, to explain that this a bit more, I invite you to uh, picture a city in your head. Uh, you've got your office buildings, you've got your car parks, roads, and restaurants. Then you have playgrounds, ovals, and skate parks. These are designated play spaces. Uh, left unchallenged, the, the scope of play uh, and our common rituals of play within that city become defined by these spaces. The existence of designated play spaces lead to formalized notions of what play is. This formalization narrows the scope of play to what a city allows to exist or deems profitable. Our rituals of play are reduced to the common verbs that exist in these spaces. So for a playground that's sliding on slides, swinging on swings. This also might make us less tolerant of new forms of play or less tolerant of people who play outside of these boundaries. So that's why it's so important to acknowledge the truth of the matter, that there is truly infinite ways for us to play and in any part of this city. This acknowledgement aims to avoid the constraint and homogenization of our rituals of play and our celebrations of playfulness. I also wanted to touch on uh, play as an aesthetic. Over time, uh, we have established cultural shorthands for play. These are formalized ideas of what play looks like or what, form, what forms play takes. Video games, as an example, are uh, an aesthetic of play. That is that they are intrinsically tied to this notion of play. Um, but the reality is games are not inherently playful. Play as an aesthetic is just that. It's simply surface level. Um, and so it does not necessarily engage with all the complexities that go into um, inspiring playful engagement. Uh, consequently, I feel as an aesthetic, um, it has contributed to, sorry, play as an aesthetic has contributed to a misunderstanding of what it means to play or be playful. An example of this would be like an office work slide. Um, so it's an aesthetic we associate with play, like a slide in a playground, um, but it's functionally devoid in this context. Uh, a cynical attempt to trick employees into believing the space is playful perhaps. Um, we think we can slap some pastel colors on something and it becomes playful. Oh, it's fixed. <laughs> Actually, encouraging playful engagement is far more complex and goes well beyond these aesthetic qualities. So it is often a bit disheartening to see the aesthetic used as a crutch, while really, we, we, sorry, it's a bit disheartening to see the aesthetic used as a crutch without really engaging with what it means to be playful. And I think this is often the issue with a lot of like gamification efforts and likely the reason why a lot of developers find the term cringe. Um, the aesthetics of play are employed, uh, but sometimes little is done in the way of reconsidering the foundational approach to engagement that would be critical to, to, to sort of encourage and benefit um, from playful engagement. So here are just some examples of playful engagement in games that I love. Um, so in the game Wonder Song, you kind of have this ability to um, sing and dance in quite an expressive way at any time, including during cutscenes. It kind of allows you to kind of role play this overly optimistic bard and inject your own tone into any kind of scene. Uh, Untitled Goose Game is really good, it has a lot of um, really great scenes set up that kind of inspire playfulness. 
Like this scene in particular is great. It's just, you know, a lunch near a lake. Um, but it just really um, inspires you to embody a jerk goose and, and chuck the sandwich in the water. Um, and it really, you know, there is no downside. There is no actual person, but it feels great to, um, to uh, do that. Um, in the game Wayward Strand, um, you can kind of choose an, there's an action that you can choose um, to just kind of like hang out in silence, uh, giving opportunity for the NPCs to speak, or sometimes they don't at all. But it's kind of interesting putting this function into players' hands uh, to be able to leave spaces empty. Um, kind of invites expression for them to choose what moments they want to sort of meditate on. Um, and, you know, gives them an opportunity to find their own meaning and readings of these moments. Uh, and then lastly, in Grace Brooksner's presents the Haunted Island a Frog Detective game. You have this little magnifying glass um, that doesn't really help you detect anything, but <laughs> it is very cute and it lets you um, sort of playfully and silly, um, yeah, playfully sort of like role play as the silly detective. Okay. So, what are the benefits of playfulness? Uh, of course, I'll be disclosing this in rap form. Not really, sorry. Uh, so, <laughs> playfulness promotes creativity and open-mindedness as, as it's interested in exploring uh, the boundaries of an experience to make the most of it, to see something from a range of perspectives and learn new things or gain new insights. People tend to be more compassionate and empathetic because they are used to engaging thoughtfully um, with a problem rather than relying on efficient or performance solutions. Uh, it also cultivates autonomous learners who are engaged in their own learning and growth. These people also tend to be self-directed and confident. Well, that sounds pretty great to me. So, how do we inspire playfulness in others? I'm gonna try and answer this by looking at what inspires me. So friends, friends is huge. Their love and acceptance give me the courage and energy to play. Um, things that are surprising or charming. Uh, novelty is a big thing for me, seeing something new and interesting. A good improv partner is good too, easy to play off. And mystery, I'll leave you all to figure that one out. Uh, Self-expression as well, having a platform to express myself uniquely. Um, I'd also like to take this moment to give a shout out to all my friends uh, uh, who encourage and inspire me to be my best every day. I love you all dearly. Love you too, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm sure you all don't need to hear this, uh, but friends are... Great. <laughs> okay. So looking at what inspires me to be playful, can we de design a game that achieves all the these things? Can a game be your friend? Can a game be surprising and charming? Can a game give you opportunities to express yourself? Well, if you wanted to design a game that we responded to like a friend, how would we do that? Well, I thought about this for a really long time, and here's what I came up with. So we all know dogs are humans' best friend, right? And puppies are super playful. So if games were just more like puppies, what would it look like? <laughs> Maybe like this, or if you prefer cats, maybe like this. <laughs> okay, so games is friends. Just like a friend, a game can be supportive and loving. Being in support of your integrity and building trust by being consistent and honest with its systems and spaces. It's about trusting a game to not discourage or punish your approach to a particular situation or problem. Also trusting that rules are consistent and spaces are honest. Um, that when you try a thing that seems like it should work, it does. When this trust is, is established, players feel empowered to express themselves and engage more deeply. The game should also be engaged with you. It gives you the sense that it is aware of you and the different ways you'd want to express yourself. 
It feels more like a relationship because it responds to your actions and it anticipates how you might want to respond to it. It also doesn't have expectations of you. Approach game design with the mentality that progress is not the point. That getting the player from point A to point B is not strictly important, but instead a likely consequence of playful engagement. This puts a larger focus on the moment-to-moment -moment engagement. Pushing players through your games with extrinsic and compulsive mod motivators or heavy-handed guidance systems rob them of the chance to engage at this deeper level. Also, create personable and likable characters and worlds, characters that inspire emotion and role play. Through this lens, you may be able to inspire players to interact with spaces and mechanics in new ways. As an example, Mario inspires positivity and can-do attitude uh, that maybe uh, inspires you to role play as this energetic character, making the notion of running and jumping through an environment feel more satisfying. Oh, strange. I have a note here that just says, wahoo. <laughs> oh, and another one that here says, wahee. OK. <laughs> Games that are surprising and charming. Uh, we can create games that are cute, charming, stylish, mysterious, whatever incites emotions and makes you enthusiastic. For me, I obviously lean uh, more towards cute things, but it's really whatever excites you. No, no particular style is inherently playful over others. Uh, the aim is to make something novel and charming because, well, novelty is like a good improv partner. Bad improv prompts are stale and difficult to play off of. In the same way, you're unlikely to respond playfully in a game um, to things that are bland and predictable. Uh, it's much easier to play off really interesting prompts. Um, a game that is novel and surprising is constantly offering fresh uh, inspiration um, that inspires playful engagement. Um, striking imagery and or audio design can also be hugely evocative, adding a richness and compelling charm to your game uh, this can be particularly affecting if the player has some control over framing the imagery and or augmenting the sounds. Uh, Self-expression in games. Offer the player a stage, a space where they can express themselves. When empowered to express, this often leads to unique self-expression. This talk is a good example of that. Offer tools so the player may express themselves. This could be something simple. Uh, as an example, in the game Shovel Knight, you have this sort of single pixel duck animation that doesn't really have any gameplay functionality. Um, it doesn't help you dodge things, but um, players will often bop up and down to, in time with the music, or maybe they'll bop up and down to express that they're impatient while they're waiting for like a moving platform or something. Um, yeah, so offering more opportunities to express yourself offers more um, chances to be playful and to realize you're being playful. Uh, it, it is really powerful to see, in your, to see your own playful engagement manifest, uh, to see this unique brand of expression. Games afford this opportunity of introspection, to reflect on how and why you did a thing. Uh, for me, this is how I became aware of when I was being playful and how that changed my attitude and approach to things inside games and out. So, recap. Foster a relationship uh, and trust with the player. Don't focus on progressing players through your game. Instead, focus on the moment to moment with the assumption that a playfully engaged player will be genuinely enthusiastic about seeing what else your game has to offer. Design likable characters and worlds that inspire role play or evoke emotion. Design your game to be a good improv partner that constantly offers juicy and fun prompts to play off. Provide opportunities for players to express themselves. And design for moments uh, for introspection, where players can witness and reflect on their playful expression. So here are some examples of where I have used these design approaches in my own games. Uh, so in my game, Life at 3.30 PM, sorry, the, the Real time is like the current real time is, the, is in the title of the game. Um, I thought it would be really funny and silly to have to check the time every time I said the name of the game. 
and I reckon it is, so. <laughs> Uh, so, anyways, the, the game progresses automatically and is not tied to how players uh, choose to interact with it, uh, allowing players to explore and engage however they choose. Uh, the mechanics and controls of the game also evolve over time, uh, keeping the experience novel and surprising. I also, I also used crowd simulation, hu human voice, and striking visuals to create charming environments uh, that inspire players to engage. There are also themes of community and creativity that can be reflected on while in a state of playful engagement, giving rise to uh, moments of introspection. Um, uh, so in my game Grasping, I intentionally designed a game that leaned away from a lot of the aesthetics we associate with play. So it's a black and white text-based game with horror elements and a minimal interface. Um, this was to drive home that uh, playfulness isn't an aesthetic, um, but a form of engagement that can be inspired even with the bleakest of interfaces. For grasping, I created an alt controller that requires players to insert their entire arm into a mysterious device to control. Uh, this is sort of a surprising and novel interaction that I hope um, sort of puts players in an attentive and playful mindset. Uh, the game has players controlling a hand by curling each of their fingers. Uh, when the fingers curl, um, they make a little chime, uh, transforming the simple interface into a little instrument and an opportunity for the player to experiment and express themselves. I used evocative sound design, synthesized voice, horror elements, and striking visual design to create something compelling for the player to sit with as the tension of the game evolves over time. Uh, the game engages with themes of longing and touch that complement the tactile physical physicality of the controller. This aims to encourage introspection uh, of our relationship to these themes and our own bodies. Okay, audience participation time. Okay, so with the person sitting next to you, I want you to spend the next 30 seconds or so coming up with your own secret wave, or if you feel comfortable to do so, um, you can do a secret handshake too. There is no rules to this, just make something up and have fun with it. Go. <laughs> Sorry. Don't worry, I have a, I have a solution. <laughs> That's next level. There's people doing feet things. <laughs> okay. All righty. I'll bring up the Okay, thank you so much. Um, I am sort of consciously aware that some people were sitting alone, um, but I came prepared. Um, so this is our secret wave. Wah, wah. <laughs> okay, so I, I would like that for any time you bump into this person during your time at, uh, at Melbourne International Games Week, uh, that you can share this secret wave with them. And I hope it's a nice moment uh, between the two of you. Cool, moving on. <laughs> Practicing and celebrating playfulness cultivates playful culture. That is why it's beneficial to provide inspiration and spaces for people to be playful, like playful games or playful spaces or giving playful talks. Now, some eagle-eyed audience members may have noticed and decoded the secret message in this talk. Bing, bong, ban, boom, wow. That's right, this talk has been secretly playful all along. I didn't just think about the ideas I wanted to share, but the ways in which I would share them. This talk intends to inspire playfulness in you, dear audience, 
and prove the impact that this type of engagement can have. So, moving towards a more playful culture, let's question some of our internalized values. If you're feeling guilty or anxious about something, question why. Celebrate your playful side, celebrate the playfulness in those around you. Inspire and encourage your friends or the culture around you to be more playful. Apply playful thinking in more spaces like the workplace or in your studies. Play radically. Rethink and expand your rituals of play. Challenge formalized, form, formalized notions of play. Because practice makes perfect. The more we practice being playful, the easier it will be to engage in this way. That's why creating spaces for people to play is so beneficial. Playfulness can become more of a default, default response that requires less of a prompt. So, what would ambition look like in an industry that values play? Would we focus more on building an industry that values uh, a cultural impact over its economic impact? Not that I need to tell Australian game devs this, we're bloody killing it, fucking struth. <laughs> and I think it's fortunate that the industry here is in a unique position to establish themselves as a cultural, culture first industry. So how does it affect our workplace values? If the process is seen as equally valuable to the product, uh, then we should see a prioritization in cultivating healthy work environments that enrich the lives of our employees. Success would not just be measured by the quality of the end product, but, by, but also by how much fun we had in the process of making it. If we hope to promote uh, and cultivate playfulness, we cannot do it at our own expenses. That's why I, I'd, I think it would be key to see this kind of shift in uh, workplace values. So how does playfulness affect our relationship to community? I feel we'd more easily recognize the value of engaging and advocating for our creative peers. It's not simply a nice thing to do, but an integral part, an integral process of nurturing a culture that celebrates play. Uh, I feel this would empower more people to recognize their value in the broader uh, creative context. If for instance, you're anything like me, and struggle to make games that fit in a commercial context. The pure act of living playfully uh, and celebrating the playfulness of others contributes to the whole. It's important to recognize uh, the significance of our individual little acts of courage as we build towards a more playful culture. As we contribute to its cultivation, uh, we, sh we should sense that we're part of something greater. Uh, and as the saying goes, the person who plants a seed may not experience the tree's shade or see its silly, playful flowers bloom. <laughs> but know that you're part of an ongoing process that, ex that seeks to enrich the lives of everyone. Because playful culture means more playful people that are autonomous learners, open-minded and compassionate, confident and creative. It also means more playful spaces that cultivate creativity, positivity, inclusivity, and collaboration. It also means a more playful society that is less judgmental and less anxious. Thank you. So just quickly, um, yeah, that's my personal Twitter, and then under it is Serenade, so the Sydney Games Collective, if you want to see when our next events are, if you're Sydney-based, um, you can follow us there to see when our next events are. Otherwise, feel free to follow me and DM me and say hello. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Uh, what is the most playful video game? <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually thinking about it now. That's the problem. <laughs> Despelote. I'll say that. 
Because most people don't know it, so you can't. <laughs> <laughs> Um, thanks for your talk, it was great. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge there was a lot of synergy with what you were saying between the games industry and the way that we, it's undervalued and, and the arts. Um, I work as an artist and I have done for, for many years and we like to think about practice as serious play, so grappling with serious subject matters but using playful ways to engage our audiences. Is that something that you would consider taking on board with your list of different ways in which we can play. Yes, I mean, yeah, like naturally, to me, uh, like playfulness is a, is a form of engagement. It's like a mindset more than it is anything else. Mm. Um, so really any way you can um, engage people playfully. And the thing is, nothing is inherently playful. So um, you might make something that engages some people uh, but doesn't to others. Um, and different people are at different stages in terms of like how much of a sort of prompt they need to be playful. Um, so yeah, definitely. The, the, yeah, the only thing that like, earlier I was touching on like the aesthetics of play, the only thing I just like worry about is when people um, take, like make something a game and then assume it's just gonna be automatically more sort of engaging for people when mm -hmm. it's, that's not necessarily true. It's, it's really the, the foundational thinking of like, well, who is my audience mm. and what what would sort of encourage them, what would inspire them? Yeah, so they're at the centre of the experience. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Can you give us a few examples of some of the more out there um, exercises of prompting playfulness in the workplace that have worked effectively? Uh, yeah, so... I wouldn't, it, it would be hard for me to necessarily say that it would be like um, somebody in charge that would encourage you to be playful, but it would be like an individual's responsibility, like as somebody who is working to avoid overworking and to, to um, yeah, engage with your work playfully in the, in the sense that you're not doing it out of a, you know, you're not doing it because of you're, you're trying to meet certain KPIs. You're doing it because you've decided it is interesting and you want to see, as, like, how far you can push it and things like that. Um, I would, be, yeah, it would be a little bit risky to necessarily sort of, like, go into a workplace and be like, hey, everybody, we're going to be playful, because I think that's a particularly, like, vulnerable place. But, you don't want to assign a formula to it. Yeah, um, but I think... On the individual level, that's kind of where I would say, try to think about how you can be more playful in your own, in your own position. And maybe ultimately, that's going to help. You know, that that'll change the the sort of company culture if you're if you're more play, playful, likely as yeah. well. Thank you. That's very encouraging. Cool. I reckon that's it. Happy GCAP. There you go.